Okay, so I asked you guys to give this problem a shot here. Um, just kind of a survey of answers. Anybody want to just give what answer they came up with? Okay, so we've got a few different answers here. Um, and I anticipated that. Looking at this problem, there are several different ways you could interpret it. I mean, one way would be just to go left to right, starting out with the 13 minus 2 and times 6 and plus 5. Um, there are several other different ways that would make sense as well. Well, in math, I had mentioned last class that there's often more than one process that will get us the right answer. But there is only one correct answer. So we have to make sure that even if we take slightly different processes, we get to the same answer. Well, in math, when we have problems like this that could be interpreted in different ways, in order to make sure that people get the same result, we've defined something called the order of operations. By the way, there was a message from last time that the sound was a little low. Um, can you guys hear me okay today? Yeah. Okay, perfect. Um, the other message I had, by the way, is I did not realize it was school policy not to allow cell phones as calculators. So just so you guys know that if you had planned on that, I'm, I'm going to stick with you guys' as school policy and we'll have to have some other form of calculator for doing quizzes and tests after today. Okay, so anyway, order of operation. What, what's that? We're going to try to order those uh, PI 30s. Okay. That is the best one, yes. Um, there's a couple of different models of it, and really for this course, it doesn't really matter which which version of the TI-30 you have. We don't need the double screen model, just the regular one? Well, there's, there's two different versions of the two-line displayed one. Like I see in the front row, there's the blue and white one. Um, that works fine. It's a little fancier you need. I think right next to it, I think he's got a little bit different one to your on your left arm. That one looks like a sharp on your... Left arm, that one. Is that a TI-30? Yeah, that's... Okay, the TI-36 is uh, does a little bit more of the business applications, but it looks, the TI-30 model that's the best one to use looks like that TI-36 that's sitting there. It's the usually black or gray and has the, the two-line display or the one-line display. Either one is fine. It's a couple dollars difference. I'm the only... You bet. Okay, so back to our order of operations. Um, a lot of people define order of operations as a set of steps for solving a problem. And it, it really isn't. What it really is, is it's just levels of priority. And all that means is if there's two things that need to be done, the thing with the highest priority has to happen first. So each number in our order of operations has an operation before it and an operation after it. And the highest priority operation has to happen first. So in our levels of priority, the highest priority is in closing symbols. Now, many of you may have just heard this as parentheses. And a parenthesis is one form of enclosing symbols. But there are some others that we're going to encounter. Second level of priority is exponents. We haven't talked about either of these yet, but exponents include two things, powers and roots. Third level of priority, multiplication. Now we had mentioned last class that multiplication and division are the same operation. One goes forward, one goes reverse. So division goes in here with multiplication. And our lowest priority, the things that happen if there's nothing else left to do, is addition. And of course, along with addition is the subtraction, because they are just the same operation. So back up to this problem here. Using our levels of priority, there are no enclosing symbols, are no exponents, there is multiplication to do. So that is where we have to start. So I'm going to take 2 times 6. I'm going to replace it with 12. 
Now there's no more multiplication, so all we have left is addition and subtraction. When there is more than one item on the same level of priority, then we do move left to right, just like reading a book. So up here, it's just subtraction and addition, so we're going to go left to right. 13 minus 12 is 1. 1 plus 5 is 6. So I know at least one of you said 6. That is the correct answer. Now before I move on to something a little bit trickier than this, I do want to talk, since we haven't done exponents yet, I'm going to spend just a minute on defining exponents. Of course, we know that, that is 6 squared. What does it mean? Perfect, 6 times 6, which would be 36. Or that is pronounced 5 cubed. We would calculate that by doing perfect, 5 times 5 times 5. It's literally repeated multiplication. 5 to the third power is 3 fives multiplied together, 125. For now, with our, we'll look at that more in depth in the next couple of weeks. For now, we're just going to do some simple powers with our order of operations. Roots. Of course, that is the square root symbol. What's the square root of 25? Somebody be brave. Five, right? Yeah. What the square root is... You know, we looked at our other operations. Multiplication and division work together. Like if I start with any number, I'll just pick the number 7 for now. If I multiply it by something, let's say I multiply it by 3, I'll get 21. If I wanted to reverse that, I would divide it by 3. It gets me back to the 7. Multiplication and division, like I said, are the same operation. One's going forward and then one's going in reverse. So multiplying by the number and then dividing by the same number will get you back where you started. It will reverse the process. Same is true for addition. Let's start with the 7 again. This time let's add 3 to it. We get to 10. If I want to get back to 7, I would subtract 3. It gets me back to the 7. Our addition and subtraction are inverses. One goes forward, one goes reverse. So if I add something to a number, to get back, I just subtract the same thing. Powers and roots work along the same lines. 6 squared is 36. The square root of 36 just reverses that and takes us back to 6. For now, that's all we really need to know about those roots. Let's take a look now at some little bit more in-depth order of operation problems. So looking at something like this, recalling our levels of priority, the highest priority is in closing symbols. So here, that's the parentheses. So we're going to have to start working inside that set of parentheses. Inside that parentheses now, our order of operations still applies. So we have to look and see if there's any other enclosing symbols. And in this case, there's not. Next, we look for exponents. And we see one right there. 2 squared, which is going to be what? 2 squared is... 4. Perfect. So I take the 2 squared and I'm replacing it with a 4. Everything else in that problem stays exactly the same. I see a lot of students when they rewrite the rest of the problem will change something or forget something. The only thing we did anything to is the 2 squared. So now we're still working inside this set of parentheses going through our levels of priority, still order of operations. No enclosing symbols. We just did our exponents. Next in line would be division and multiplication of division. So we have the division. 12 divided by 4 gives us 3. Perfect. 
So we have 8 plus the 3, 7 minus 3. So again, we took the 12 divided by 4, we replaced it with the 3, and nothing else in the problem changed. Still inside our parentheses here, we have 7 minus 3 to do. 7 minus 3 is 4. Perfect. Once again, we replace the 7 minus 3 with 4, and everything else stays the same. Now we've reached a spot where we've reduced what's inside that enclosing symbol, in this case our parentheses, to a single number. So we don't need that enclosing symbol anymore. So we have to look outside of it to make sure there's nothing that needs to be done first. In this case, there's nothing that has to be done to that parentheses before we can get rid of it. But now that it's down to a single number, we can get rid of the parentheses. When we get rid of any enclosing symbol, we have to look for two things. One is there's something we have to do. Parentheses don't require an operation, so we don't have to do anything there. Two is are there any implied items that have to be put in here? And in this case, there is. That three in front of the parentheses implies that the three is doing what to the parentheses? There it is, multiplication. So when I take out that parentheses around the four, I have to make sure I put in a multiplication symbol there to replace what was implied by the parentheses. Now, of course, I have 3 plus 4, or 3 times 4 is 12. So I replace the 3 times 4 with 12. And 8 plus 12 is 20. Doesn't look so bad? Let's step it up a notch. By the way, um, before I go to the next problem, the place that I will see the most mistakes made on this will be right from the beginning. It's very, very tempting. People always say, oh, 8 plus 3 is 11. Let's do that first. Why can't we do that? Well, it doesn't follow the order of operations, but what's the issue? Remember we said every number, except unless it's the first number or the last number, Every number has two operations happening to it, one in front of it and one after it. The 3 has addition in front of it, but after it is multiplication. Which one has a higher priority? Multiplication. So the 3 cannot do the addition until it does the multiplication. It has a higher priority. So we can't add the 3 to the 8 until the 3 is multiplied, whatever is in the parentheses. A little carried away there. Let me slide that over. There. This one's just a little bit more difficult. It looks kind of like a monster, but it isn't that bad. So as I look at this one, again, highest level of priority is enclosing symbols. But I see several parentheses here. Remember what we said, though. If there's more than one thing at the same level of priority, we work left to right. So going left to right, the first parentheses we see is this one here. So we have to find its other end. We go here. That one is facing the wrong way. That one goes back to this one. That one's also facing the wrong way. That one goes back to that one. This here is the one that has to be its other end. So we're going to start by working inside that set of parentheses inside the blue box. Now you might be thinking, but there's we got to go inside there. We do. Inside the blue box, our order of operations still applies. So inside that set of parentheses, and inside that set of parentheses, we still have to look for other enclosing symbols. And we see more parentheses. 
going left to right inside there, the first one we come to is this one. So we're going to focus inside that set of parentheses, inside the green box. In there, we go through our order of operations again. No more enclosing symbols, but we do have an exponent. 2 to the third is... What's 2 to the third? 8. There we go. So replace 2 to the third with 8. And everything else stays exactly the same. Now, because this is such a long problem, and because I might be just a little bit lazy, I'm going to show you a shortcut here. And it works much better on my, my computer screen, of course, than it does on your paper. Um, but rather than rewriting the whole problem every time, I'm going to start erasing and replacing stuff. And I'll show you how that works. I'll rewrite it every now and then just to, to refresh the problem. But now I realize for some of you, if you're taking notes, you can't keep up writing things down. You can always go back on the recording and pause the recording and write down each step if you want to. Okay, so we're still looking here inside this inner set of parentheses. Only one thing left to do there, which is... 16 divided by 8, which gives us what? 2. So I erase the 16 divided by 8. I replace it with 2. Now, just like in the last problem, we've reduced what's inside that parentheses to a single number. So I can get rid of the parentheses. Parentheses don't imply any sort of operation or, or don't require us to do anything, at least. So we don't have to do anything there. But we do have to put in, in front of the parentheses here, our multiplication. So now we're back out to the larger set of parentheses, but order of operations is still in effect. Are there any other enclosing symbols? And there sure are, right here. So now we have to focus inside that set of parentheses. In there, we're going through our levels of priority still, orders of operations. No exponents, but there is multiplication. 3 times 2 makes 6. Good. Now we, all we have left is addition and subtraction, so we're going to go left to right. What's 7 plus 6? 13. And then 13 minus 8 is 5. Great. Now, once again, we've reduced what's in the parentheses to a single number. So I can get rid of it. Here, do I have to insert any operations when I take the parentheses out? Now, if I look at it, there's addition on both sides. There's already an operation on both sides of the parentheses. I don't need to put any operation in there. Up here, there was nothing between that two and the parentheses. So I had to put in that implied multiplication. Now I can go back out to the larger parentheses here. I'm going to rewrite this just to make things a little bit more compact. So I'm back out to just the, the larger parentheses. In there again, no more enclosing symbols, no more exponents. We do have multiplication. 2 times 2, which is... 2 times 2 is 4. There we go. So now, no more multiplication or division. So we're just going through that parentheses with our addition and subtraction, going left to right. 11 minus 4. 7. 7. 7 plus 5. 12. 12. Good. And 12 plus 1. 13. So once again, we've reduced what's in the parentheses to a single number. And get rid of it. What do I have to remember? Put in our multiplication again. Very good. So now, no more enclosing symbols. No more exponents. Simply multiplication. 5 times 3 is... 
Right. 5 times 13 is 65. Thank you. You caught it even though I screwed it up. Thanks. So now we've got 7 plus 65 is 72. And minus 2 makes 70. Great. How many of you think you can handle problems like that? Show of hands. Most of you? Yeah. Okay. Now, that's just a single type of problem. I said there were other types of enclosing symbols. Let me show you a little bit different type of problem here. So this one here, that ain't going to work out. For this one here, we have this line across the middle. To solve it, we have to figure out what that line means. What does it mean? Okay, division. Most people say division. And it does mean division. It's called a fraction bar. And as we said, it means division. But it's also an enclosing symbol. It's telling us that we have to do everything on top first. Then we have to do everything on bottom. Then we have to divide. So looking at the top up here, what do we have to do first? Careful. We have an exponent yet. We've got to do the exponent first. So we have 8 times 5 minus 40 divided by 2 to the third power is... 8, perfect. 2 times 2 times 2 is 8. Now we go back and do the 8 times 5, which is 40. Now I have people that ask me all the time, couldn't we just do the multiplication and then the division here at the same step? In this case we could, but there are some times where that causes problems. So I kind of caution against that. It's, it's best to stay out of the habit of doing more than one operation at the same step. Now what do we have to do next? 40 divided by 8 gives us 5. And then 40 minus 5 is 35 and plus 1 is 36. Good. So we get 36 on top. Now we go to the bottom. What do we have to do first on bottom? Three times seven, which is 21. 21, perfect. Then what? 45 divided by nine is five. And then 21 minus five is 16, plus two is 18, good. So on bottom we get 18. All that's left to do is divide. 36 divided by 18 is 2. Any questions? Okay. A little bit different version. Here we see that square root symbol. The technical name for it is actually the radical symbol. Um, here it's just a square root. In this case, it has more than one operation in it, more than one number in it. So it is also serving as an enclosing symbol. So there's no other enclosing symbols. So that's telling us we have to do what's inside that square root first. So inside there, of course, order of operations still applies. What do we have to do first? Nine times seven is 
much. 63, there we go. You were just getting a step ahead of us. Now we do the 1 plus 63 to get. There we go, 64. Now here, just like with the parentheses, we reduced what's in the enclosing symbol to a single number. But slightly different, um, the parentheses, we could just take them away. Um, the only thing we had to watch for is if we had to put in multiplication. Here, when we remove that enclosing symbol, when we remove the radical, we actually have to do the square root. So what is the square root of 64? Eight, Eight perfect. Just like the parentheses, though, we had the number in front with no operation. That implies multiplication, so I have to put that in there. So we have 7 plus 3 times 2, or 3 times, 7 plus 3 times 8, sorry. 3 times 8 makes what? 24. And 7 plus 24 is 31. Perfect. Okay. So that kind of wraps up everything we need to do with whole numbers for the course. Um, there is a quiz on this, but I think what will work best is if I hold off and have you guys... No, that's okay. Um, I think it will work best if I hold off and have you guys do the quiz at the end of the hour instead of interrupting class right now. Um, just to, any of you guys in football, do you guys have to leave early for the game today or are you guys here until the end of class? No, they're here to the end. They're here to the end. Good. Okay, just making sure. So what we'll do is probably at about uh, 3.10, 3.15 or so, I'll let you guys get started on the quiz. So anyway, our new topic for today, we're going to look at fractions. Now I realize, just like our whole numbers, this is something you guys have all seen before. But I like to go through it just to make sure everybody's on the same page. As we saw last class, a fraction is a single number with two parts. The numerator, in this case the 3, is a count. That tells us how many of something we have. So 3 fourths is telling us we have 3 of something. Just like if we had three inches, or three pounds, or three cows. The denominator is a name, which is telling us what it is we have. That would be the inches, or the pounds, or the cows. So the first step we have to go through to, to understand fractions is to define what does it mean to have a name of fourths. Well, I wish there were a better way of doing it, but we have to go back to the old elementary school illustration of a pie or a pizza. A fourth means we take that and cut it into four equal pieces. Pretend those are equal. So a fourth means that every whole object gets cut into four equal pieces. Or we could look at it the other way. It takes four of those pieces to make a whole object. Now, the 3 is telling us that we have 3 of those pieces. Now, our first step to working with fractions, as we saw last class, we had, I think we had 1 third plus 2 fifths. We couldn't add or subtract them because they had different names. So our first step is going to be to try to rename them. And the simplest way to rename a fraction using this illustration would be to simply cut each slice into equal slices. So I'm going to cut each slice here into three more equal slices. So now looking at this illustration, we had, it took four pieces to make the whole thing before. Now how many slices does it take to make the whole thing? Twelve. Perfect. We had 4, we cut each into 3. 4 times 3 makes 12. Before we had 3 pieces, now how many pieces do we have in the yellow? 9, good. We had 3, we cut each of them into 3, so 3 times 3 is 9. Do we have any more or less than we did before? No. What we have, the, the colored in space is exactly the same amount as it was before. 9 twelfths 
and 3 fourths are exactly the same amount. They just look different. Well, how were we able to multiply and still keep the same amount? Well, it's because of what we did here. We multiplied by 3 over 3. 3 over 3 is telling us, well, the bottom 3 is telling us it takes 3 pieces to make a whole object. The top 3 is telling us we have 3 pieces. In other words, we have one whole object. If we multiply something by 1, what does it do to its value? It keeps it the same. It does nothing to its value. It doesn't change it. So we cannot change its value by multiplying by 1, but we can change its appearance. And that's exactly what we do here when we're multiplying by the same number on top and bottom. Um, this concept, this is what we call a unity fraction. And this is a very basic application of it here. But when we get into measurement and measurement conversion, that concept of a unity fraction is extremely powerful. It allows us to do all of our measurement conversions Again, changing the appearance, but not changing the value. All right, so here, this first one, we changed 3 fourths to 9 twelfths. We just randomly picked a number to multiply both the numerator and denominator by. Most of the time, there's a specific value that we want to change it to. So we have to figure out what we have to multiply by. So for example, if I have 2 fifths, and I want to change it into 30ths, I have to figure out what do I multiply 5 by to change it into 30. 6. So we have to do the exact same thing to the numerator. We have to multiply that by 6. 2 times 6 gives us 12. 12 thirtieths is exactly the same value as 2 fifths. So if I have 3 eighths, and I want to change it into 30 seconds. What number is going to go up here? What do we have? What do we multiply an 8 by to turn it into 32? 4. four. So what do we have to do to the 3? Multiply by 4. 3 times 4 is 12. So 12 30 seconds has the same value as 3 eighths. Now as we've seen, you know, multiplication and division together, addition and subtraction together, and even our powers and roots together, everything in math is reversible. So if I wanted to take my 12 30 seconds and change it back to 3 eighths, I could just reverse the process. Dividing by 4 on both the top and bottom. 12 divided by 4 is 3, 32 divided by 4 is 8, we get 3 eighths. We've already shown that 3 eighths and 12 30 seconds are equivalent. So not only can we multiply both the top and bottom by the same number, we can divide both top and bottom by the same number. This is often more useful to us. We'll run into something like this, 48 over 60. We have to look at that and figure out can we divide both of them by the same number, and what number is it? Well, looking at this, there's several things we can do. Um, when I'm trying to reduce a fraction, the first thing I usually look for is tens. How can I tell if a number can be divided by 10? The last digit is zero. 60 can be divided by 10, but 48 can't be. So both numbers have to be able to divide by it for it to work. So if there's no 10s, I look for 5. How do I tell if something can be divided by 5? There we go. The last digit is 5 or 0. Well, the 60 is still 0. Oops, 5 or 5. Sorry, 5 or 0. Um, so the 60 is still a 0, so we can divide that by 5. The 48 does not have a 5 or 0, so we can't divide that. Now I usually skip down then from here to 2. The reason I do 2 is 2s are easier to find. How can I tell if it's something that's divisible by 2? 
that's even. Very good. The last digit's even. In other words, it's 0, 2, 4, 6, or 8 in the last digit. Both 48 and 60 are divisible by 2. So I know I can do that. Um, before I go up and do that, let me check this. Then after 2's, I would check 3's. Does anybody know the shortcut for telling if something's divisible by 3? It's the sum of the digits. I'll show you what I mean there quick. Let's say I have 17,247. What's that going to give me? That should work. If I want to know if that's divisible by 3 without having to divide it all out, I'm going to add together the digits. So it's 1 plus 7. 8 plus 2 is 10. Plus 4 10 plus 4, 14, and plus 7, 21. 21. That adds up to 21. Is 21 divisible by 3? Yes. So since 21 is divisible by 3, 17,247 is also divisible by 3. So anyway, let's go back up here. To reduce 48 over 60, 48 doesn't end in 0, can't divide it by 10. Um, doesn't end in 5, can't divide it by 5. But it is even, so I can divide it by 2. So let's go ahead and do it, divided by 2. 48 divided by 2, 24. What's 60 divided by 2? 30. I look at that. Now, some of you might be saying, oh, no, no, you've got to divide by something larger. Uh, many of us were taught that you had to divide by the greatest common factor, the biggest number that goes into both of them. Not necessarily true. You can divide by whatever and just keep going. Looking at the 24 and 30, both of those can still be divided by 6. six. Very good. I was going to say 2, but yeah, you caught that there's a larger number. They can both be divided by 6. One of the reasons why I do this, if once you divide by one number and you get to a little bit smaller numbers, a lot of times it's easier now to see that. At 48 and 60, it maybe wasn't so simple to see you could divide by 6. But now at 24 and 30, it's a little bit easier to see you can divide by 6. 24 divided by 6 is 4. 30 divided by 6? 5. 5, so it's 4 fifths. Now if you had seen it, you could have divided by 12 right away. And dividing by 12 would take you straight to 4 fifths. But you don't have to do it that way. I'm going to assume you guys have done reducing fractions in your time, so I'm not going to spend any more time on that. But I am going to look at this. What if we have something like this? 44 over 7. Now, the 7 is telling us it takes 7 pieces to make a whole object. If we have 44 of them, we have enough pieces to make a whole object. In fact, we have enough pieces to make several whole objects. So how do we know, how can we figure out how many objects we can make? Divide them, okay. If I punch it into the calculator, if I do 44 divided by 7, I get 6.285714 approximately. What's that tell us? Somebody said it. It goes in there six times, right? We can get six whole objects out. But the fact that there's stuff after the decimals tells us there's something left over. We still have some of those sevens left. The calculator can be a little tricky for doing this. To me, it's easier to do it by hand. It's basically a long division with a remainder. It's 44 divided by 7. 7 goes into 44 six times. 6 times 7 is 42. There are two pieces left over, two of those 7s. So 44 over 7 is 6 and 2 7s. Now many of you can do this in your head of you know, dividing out the 44 by 7 and figuring out how much is left over, and that's fine. I'm never going to make you write it out, but be aware that you can if you get into fractions that are a little trickier to work with.
So, just off the top of your head, can you tell me what is 23 fifths if I split it up like that? Four and three fifths, perfect. Now this, where we started here, the 23 over five is called an improper fraction. Nothing, imp the word improper implies there's something wrong with it. There really isn't anything wrong with it. And it's just, we don't like having the numerator bigger than the denominator. This is what we call the four and three fifths. It's called a mixed number. That's because it mixes whole numbers and fractions, whole objects and the pieces left over. So we've gone from improper fractions to mixed numbers. More often, or just as often, it's handy to go the other direction, from a mixed number to an improper fraction. So I might have 3 and 2 fifths, and I want to change that back into an improper fraction. To do that, I have to take these three whole objects here and split them back into pieces. How many pieces are in each of them? Well, it tells us how many pieces are in each is our denominator, the 5. So we take that 3 times 5 gives us 15 pieces. The three whole objects contain 15 pieces. What do we do with the 15? We're going to add it to the 2. We already had two pieces there. So 2 plus 15 is 17 fifths. So when we're changing from that mixed number into an improper fraction, all we're doing is taking that whole number, breaking it back into pieces, and adding it to what's there already in the numerator. So if we have 5 and 3 fourths, change that into an improper fraction. First of all, what's the denominator going to be? 4. Four. The denominator never changes. What's our numerator going to be? What'd you come up with? 23, good. 5 times 4 is 20, plus the 3 is 23 fourths. Okay, so we've done all that so that we can look at our operations with fractions now. We had looked at 1 third plus 2 fifths, and we had said we couldn't add them because they have different names. Well, now we have the tools to give them the same name. Before we can do that, however, we need to know what that same name is going to be. Now, I prefer to add vertically, so I'm going to set them up vertically like this. To figure out what that same name, or common denominator is the common math term for it, to figure out what that common denominator is, there are a few different strategies. One of them is just to multiply the denominators. 3 times 5 is 15. That will always be a common denominator. Now, you've always been told you have to find the least common or smallest common denominator. That's not necessarily true. So, if I don't want to just multiply them together and take my chances, how else can I go about it? Well, we can take our two denominators, 3 and 5, and we can make lists. If I'm going to count up by 3, I got 3, another 3 would be 6, 9, 12, 15, 18, and so on. I can do the same for the 5. Counting up by 5 would be 5, 10, 15. There's my first match. So 15 is the least common denominator here. There are other strategies that involve factoring. Um, we're not going to get into those in here. If it's something you're curious about, let me know and I can show you. But if we're going into more of the, the algebra side of dealing with algebraic fractions, that factoring will become a, a huge key. So anyway, our common denominator is 15. We have to change both of these fractions to 15 What did we do to the 3 to turn it into a 15? Multiply by 5. So our 1 has to be multiplied by 5 to make 5. 
What do we do to our 5 to turn it into a 15? Multiply by 3. Perfect. So 2 times 3 makes 6. So now it's just 5 plus 6 is 11. When we add numbers, we combine the counts. So 5 plus 6 is 11. But we keep the same name, 15. I'm not going to spend any more time with simple fractions for addition. We're going to jump up to mixed numbers. So I might have 7 and 1 fourth plus 2 and 3 eighths. So I'm going to need a common denominator just like with fractions. Now you'll see that I rewrote the whole number. Um, a lot of textbooks have you just rewrite the fraction and keep the whole number up front. I rewrite it just because I have a tendency, um, I work with the fractions and I forget the whole number was back out there. So I bring the whole number with me just so I don't forget about it. For 4 and 8, what's our common denominator going to be? It's going to be 8. Sometimes the common denominator is one of the existing denominators. So since the 8 didn't change, the 3 does not change. What do we do to the 4 to turn it into an 8? Multiply by 2. So 1 times 2 makes that 2 eighths. You'll see we've got that fraction at the end of the number lined up just like it's the last digit of the number because that's exactly what it is. That fraction is just the last digit of the number. So when we line up, we line up the 1s and the 10s and the 100s. We also line up the fractions. Once it has the same name, 2 eighths and 3 eighths here, we can go ahead and add down our columns. Just like any other whole number, we start on the right and work our way back to the left. 2 eighths plus 3 eighths is 5 eighths, and 7 plus 2 is 9. Now it doesn't stay that simple. We might have 6 and 5 sixths plus 4 and 3 fourths. So we're going to go to find our common denominator here. What's the common denominator going to be? 12. Perfect. We could do 6 times 4 would be 24, and that would work. But 12 is smaller, so we're going to do the 12. I'm going to skip some steps here. What has to go up here above this 12? 10. Perfect. 6 times 2 makes 12. 5 times 2 makes 10. What has to go here? Nine. Nine. Good. Four times three, so three times three. And now again, we're going to add, starting on the right, working our way back to the left. Ten twelfths plus nine twelfths. Nineteen twelfths. Now we see that that is an improper fraction. We can take one whole object out of there. How many pieces would be left over? 7, so 7 twelfths. So we're going to, just like anything else, we're going to keep part of it and carry part of it. It's the fraction digit here, so we keep the fraction, and we carry the 1. 1 and 6 makes 7, and 4 makes 11. So 11 and 7 twelfths. Not too bad? Okay, let's hit subtraction. Now, just like addition, I'm going to jump to mixed numbers for subtraction. So let's look at 9 and 4 fifths minus 3 and, oh, let's make it interesting, 2 sevenths. Common denominator will be what? 35. Just multiplying those two together is the best we can do. What goes up here? 20, uh, 28, right? 5 times 7, so 4 times 7 makes 28. What goes here? 10, good. 7 times 5, so 2 times 5. Now just like with addition, that fraction is the last digit of our number. So we start with it and we work our way back to the left. 28 minus 10 is 18, and just like addition, we keep the same name. 
All right, 9 minus 3 is 6. Again, it doesn't stay that simple. We can have 8 and 1 third minus 5 and 3 fourths. Need our common denominator, which is going to be 12. This will be what? Four, right? And what's going to go here? Nine. Four times three, so three times three makes nine. Now we go to subtract. Again, starting on the right, we're going to go back to the left. Four twelfths minus nine twelfths. Well, four minus nine can't be done without going negative. So just like any other subtraction, we have to borrow. We borrow from the 8 and make it a 7. The difference is we can't just put a 1 in front of this here. What we borrowed was one whole object. The denominator tells us how many pieces were in it. There were 12 pieces. That's 4 plus 12 then means we now have 16 pieces, or 16 twelfths. So now it's 16 minus 9, 7 twelfths. 7 minus 5 is 2. So 2 and 7 twelfths. So when we borrow with subtraction of fractions, we have to make sure that we use that denominator to tell us how many pieces we really borrowed. Let's do one more example of borrowing with subtraction. Something like 43 and 1 8 minus... 28 and 5, 6. What's my common denominator going to be? 24. What's this number going to be? 24. Somebody be brave. Has to be 3, right? 8 times 3, so 1 times 3. What's this one going to be? 6 times 4 makes 24, so 5 times 4 makes 20. So now we go to subtract. 3 minus 20 again can't be done. So we borrow from the 3. It becomes a 2. What do we do to our 3? We add how much? 24. We add what the denominator is. The denominator tells us how many pieces we just borrowed. 3 plus 24 is 27. 24 is. And we subtract. 27 minus 20 is 7. 24 is. Then we add to our rest of our subtraction. 2 minus 8, we've got to borrow. That's 3 and 12. 12 minus 8 is 4. 3 minus 2 is 1. So 14 and 7 24ths. Let's look at multiplication. Look at 3 fourths times 2 fifths. When we multiply, do we need the same name? Say no. No, good. We don't need the same name. So that means we do not need to find a common denominator. When we multiply, we're simply going to combine the counts. 3 times 2 makes 6. Then we're also going to combine the names. 4 times 5 makes 20. Now as we look at this, we see that we can reduce both of those. Divide each of those by 2. Gives us 3 tenths. So we've got 3 over 10. Now some of you might be looking at this thinking he could have cross-canceled. or sometimes called cross-multiply. Others right now might be wondering what is cross-canceling. Well, when we look at this, it's going to become 3 times 2 over 4 times 5. We see that both the 4 and the 2 could be divided by 2. So rather than multiplying it and then reducing, we can reduce it before we multiply. 
We can divide both the 4 and 2 by 2. 4 divided by 2 is 2. 2 divided by 2 is 1. And now, when we multiply, 3 times 1 is 3. 2 times 5 is 10. We reduced before we multiplied, so we get a reduced answer. In this problem, it's about the same amount of work either way. I could do something like, oh, let's see, 24 25th times 35, 36. If I were going to do that, I could multiply it all out and I could get 24 times 35 is, what is it? 840. And 25 times 36 is 900. And then I could reduce that. Um, can any of you see that that is reducible by, what, 6, 60? Or I could look at that. 34, 24. 24 over 25 times 35 over 36. And I could say, hey, both 25 and 35 can be divided by 5. 25 divided by 5 is 5. 35 divided by 5 is 7. 24 and 36, well, they can both be divided by a lot of things. Just like reducing any other fraction, we could start by doing twos or threes. For the sake of speed, both of those can be divided by 12. So I'm going to do that. 24 divided by 12 is 2. 36 divided by 12 is 3. So we have 2 times 7 is 14. 5 times 3 is 15. We get 14 fifteenths. If we reduce this, we would have got 14 fifteenths as well. In this case, I think it's much easier to reduce before we multiply. We get smaller numbers. Now again, I'm not going to stick to using simple fractions. I'm going to jump up to mixed numbers. Like, oh, let's see here. 3 and 1 fourth times 7 and 3 fifths. Now, actually, multiplying mixed numbers is a fairly difficult process. And to be truthful, if we went to a university and found 10 math majors and asked them how to, how to multiply mixed numbers, I'd actually be surprised if even one of them got it right. So rather than multiplying mixed numbers, we cheat. We're going to change them to improper fractions. What is 3 and 1 fourth become as an improper fraction? Anybody? 3 times 4 is 12, plus 1 is 13. The denominator never changes, so it's 13 fourths. How many fifths then for 7 and 3 fifths? Careful. 38, there we go. Now at this point, now that it's improper fractions, just like any other multiplication of fractions, we can cross-cancel. Our 4 and 38 can both be divided by 2. 38 divided by 2 is 19. 4 divided by 2 is 2. So now we'll multiply straight across. 13 times 19 is 247, right? 2 times 5 is 10. So I've got to reduce that back down to a mixed number. 247 divided by 10. 10 goes into 24 twice. That's 20. 4 left over. Bring down the 7. 10 goes into 47 four times. That's 40 with 7 left over. So 24 and 7 tenths. Any questions? Since we have a couple minutes, just for fun, I'm going to show you how you'd actually multiply that out as mixed numbers. Now, if you remember... Um, when we did like whole numbers, 23 times 45. 
Not only did the 5 have to multiply the 3, it also had to multiply the 2. The same thing happens with our mixed numbers. The 3 fifths has to multiply the 1 fourth. 3 fifths times 1 fourth is going to be 3. 5 times 4 is 20. But the 3 fifths also has to multiply the 3. How do we multiply a fraction times a whole number? We make it 3 over 1. So it's now a fraction. 3 times 3 is 9. 5 times 1 is 5. 9 fifths or 1 and 4 fifths. Now we move to the 7. 7 times 1 fourth. Again, we make 7 a fraction by putting it over 1. 7 times 1 is 7. 1 times 4 is 4. 7 over 4 is 1 and 3 fourths. And we do the 7 times 3, which is 21. Now we have to combine all this. To do that, we need a common denominator, which is going to be 20 -ths. 3 twentieths doesn't change. How many twentieths is this going to be? Four fifths is how many twentieths? Five times four. Four times four makes sixteen twentieths. Three fourths is how many twentieths? Fifteen. Good. So now we're going to add three and sixteen is nineteen. Plus 15 is 34. That's 34 twentieths. That's 1 and 14 twentieths. So the 14 twentieths to reduce by 2. So I'm going to reduce that as I bring it down. That's 7 tenths. I'm going to carry the 1. 1 plus 1 is 2. Plus another 1 is 3. Plus another 1 is 4. And then the 2. 24 and 7 tenths. Which is what we had before. Between you and me, I'll be sticking with doing it with improper fractions. It's a lot less work. But if you really do want to work with the mixed numbers, you can. Let's do one more example of multiplying mixed numbers, and then we'll hit division. So let's do 7 and 1 fifth times... Three and two thirds. So what's the first thing I have to do here? Not everybody at once. I have to change them into what? Improper fractions, right? So this is going to become how many fifths? I heard somebody say 36. This is going to be how many thirds? 11. 11. Perfect. Before I multiply, what do I want to do? I mean, I could multiply, but I can reduce. Both those divide by 3. 3 divided by 3 is 1. 36 divided by 3 is 12. Now, 11 times, or 12 times 11 is 132. 5 times 1 is 5. 5. So 132 divided by 5 to turn it back into a mixed number. 5 goes into 13 twice, that's 10. One left over. Bring down the 12. Oops, sorry, one left over. Three left over. Bring down the 2. 5 goes into 32 six times. 6 times 5 is 30. There's 2 left over. That is 26 and 2 fifths. Not so bad, right? Now, just like with whole numbers, I, mean, I showed you with whole numbers that whole repeated subtraction thing for division. Um, division with fractions has also been greatly changed to make it simpler and easier to the point where it doesn't look anything like the real process anymore. 
Now we had said division and multiplication follow the same rules. When I multiplied, I just multiplied straight across. Does that mean I can divide straight across? Can I do 12 divided by 4 is 3? 25 divided by 5 is 5? Does that work? Yeah, it sure does. Is that the right answer? Yes, it is. And it'll work every time. So why don't we do it that way? That was pretty simple. Well, because we run into things like this. 3 fourths divided by 2 thirds. When we go to divide that, 3 divided by 2 is 1.5. 4 divided by 3 is 1.33333. It does not divide out nice and evenly. So how were we taught to divide that? I heard somebody say it. Multiply by what? The reciprocal. We take the 2 thirds, we flip it over to become 3 over 2. So our first number never changes. 3 fourths stays 3 fourths. We change it from dividing by 2 thirds to multiplying by the reciprocal, which is 3 over 2. So now 3 times 3 is 9. 4 times 2 is 8. 9 eighths are 1 and 1 eighth. Now, as I said, this process of multiplying by a reciprocal actually comes from what I just did up here. Let me show you how. Once upon a time, 3 fourths divided by 2 thirds, what we would have done is we would have looked at this and said, okay, 2 thirds is reduced. There's nothing we can do to reduce that. So I'm going to take my numerator times my denominator. 2 times 3 makes 6. I'm going to use that 6 to rename my first fraction. So I'm going to multiply by 6 on top and bottom, or 6 over 6. What is 3 times 6? 18. What's 4 times 6? 24. Now, 3 fourths and 18 24ths have exactly the same value. Just made it look different. So now if I divide by 2 thirds, 18 divided by 2 is 9. 24 divided by 3 is 8. It is 9 eighths or 1 and 1 eighth. So how did we get from this to multiplying by reciprocal? Well, at some point, somebody realized when they looked at this, if we bend our order of operations a little bit, instead of doing the multiplication first, if we divide here, the 6 over 6 and divide by 2 over 3, 6 divided by 2 is 3. 6 divided by 3 is 2. What we get when we divide is always going to be this fraction flipped upside down. So they named it the reciprocal, and they defined a division to be multiplying by the reciprocal. So when we're multiplying by the reciprocal, all we're doing is an extreme shortcut of this process. So anyway, let's actually do an example or two here, and then I'll get you started on your quiz. So 7 and 1 third divided by 2 and 4 fifths. Now if we're going to change this to multiplying by a reciprocal, it only makes sense that we do the same thing we did for multiplication, which is turn them into improper fractions. 7 and 1 third becomes how many thirds? 22, good. 2 and 4 fifths becomes how many fifths? 14. Now, can we cross cancel here? Well, no, not only is there nothing that would cross cancel, but it's still division at this point. We can only cross cancel in multiplication. So the, the first number never changes. So 22 over 3. The second number, we flip it over. We take the reciprocal. 14 over 5 becomes 5 over 14. Now it's multiplication. What do we want to do next? Before we multiply, now we can cross cancel. 
22 and 14 both can be divided by 2, giving me 11 and 7. 11 times 5 is 55. 3 times 7 is 21. So 55 divided by 21. 21 goes into 55 twice. That's 42. We have 13 left over. So 2 and 13 21st. What do you all think? Okay. Um, I know I went through a lot of stuff there. But anyway, in your little book, the units that cover what we did today, it's going to be units 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, and actually we'll stop at 9. We'll go over stuff for 10. Now again, just like last time, just do the odd numbered problems. Um, I know I cut you kind of short if I'm going to do a quiz here. Um, I'll let you start on the quiz before you start on the homework. On Wednesday, I promise I'll give you a little bit more homework time. So if you don't get these all done, you get a little bit more time to finish them up on Wednesday. With that, I'll give you guys the last 15 minutes. Um, Mr. Uh, Berghammer there will pass out the quiz for you, please. Thank you. And then if you want to work on the quiz, and then we'll work on the homework as well. Thank you. Good luck tonight, guys. Good luck in your football game. Thank you. You bet.